Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. Blessings from Union Avenue. Oh, Blessings from Union Avenue. Hello, Church, at Blessings from Union Avenue. Hello, Church, Blessings from Union Avenue. Hello, Church. And blessings from Union Avenue. Good morning, Church. Hello, Church. And blessings from Union Avenue. Hello, Church. And blessings from Union Avenue. Good morning, Church. And blessings from Union Avenue. Hello, Church. And blessings from Union Avenue. Good morning, Church. And blessings from Union Avenue. Hello, Church. And welcome to Union Avenue Christian Church. Hello, Church. And blessings from Union Avenue. Good morning, Church. And blessings from Union Avenue. Hello, Church. And blessings from Union Avenue. Let the whole creation cry. everyone and greeting to you all this day. Some dates in history linger in our minds. Certainly September 11, 2001 marked a turning point in modern history, as did December 7, 1941. Or on a more positive note, Juneteenth, 1865 or July 4, 1776. These are all dates that are important in our national history. With apologies to our Canadian viewership, bear with me here for a moment. They, in part, define who we are as a people and frame our collective identity. If we were British, perhaps we'd remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I know of no reason the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. November 5th, 1605. Well, it's no different in Bible times. The year 587 BCE is one of those dates that still defines the identity of God's people. How's the song go that we still sing about it? O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lowly exile here. In 587, the Babylonian Empire invaded the kingdom of Judah, completely destroying Jerusalem and the temple, and hauling much of the peop of the population off to Babylon as slaves in exile. Even the musical Godspell recounts this story with its song based upon Psalm 137. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres, for our captors there required of us 
songs, and our tormentors, mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing? Sing the Lord's songs in a foreign land. That psalm, and many others, recalls the events of 587 and weaves its story into the tapestry of a people. Another big year is 539 BCE. Uh, That's when King Cyrus of Persia had conquered Babylon and issued an edict releasing the Jewish captives to go back home. Their homecoming had been long in waiting, and those who returned faced the difficult task of rebuilding from the ruins of what once was. But rebuild they did. According to the prophet Haggai, they had found the original cornerstone from the temple and began to put things back to how they were. And if you want to do the math, that date has been calculated to December 18th, 520 BCE. Now, the book of the prophet Ezra tells us that this second temple was completed in March of 515 BCE. And so, while the returned exiles were able to rebuild and complete their work over several years, apparently they had run into some serious problems and delays. Haggai recounts how mildew and hail had devastated the people in their efforts and set them back greatly. Their provisions and progress had been destroyed by unexpected hardship and plague. Sound familiar? And not only were the people discouraged with how things were going and were beginning to settle for something less than God's dream for them, Their social contract was beginning to unravel and their covenant of love for one another deteriorate. In our scripture for today, Zechariah tells the people, Do not be afraid. These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another and love no false oath. For all these are things that I hate, says the Lord. Biblical scholar David Peterson calculates Zechariah's message to the year 518, oddly enough, December 7th of that year. That puts it in the middle of rebuilding the temple. Not even two years into their work, the people's dreams of rebuilding their past have come up short not only because of not having provided themselves enough resources to do the work, and not only because of a deadly plague that was wiping them out, but they were giving in to fear and doubt, letting grievance and grief loosen their grip on graciousness and lose sight of what bound them together in the first place. These last two years for us have been difficult. 18 months of Corona tide and two years since our last homecoming Sunday. Just as we were making headway with recurring visitors, renovating education spaces and, and looking to add back children's ministry staff after years without the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, which we now simply know as COVID-19, shut down our in-person congregating for worship, study, fellowship, and service. Our entire congregational life, which had been built exclusively upon the analog experience, suddenly had no way to happen. And we found ourselves ill-prepared to all of the sudden reinvent ourselves in a digital world. We've lost church members, family members, friends and neighbors to COVID-19. We've lost people to moving away to be with family, 
a trend that still continues as people reassess their priorities in this new normal and, and something we understand, accept, and affirm. We lost our habit and weekly rhythm of going to church in all the ways we were used to doing so. We lost all the ways our connectedness happened automatically, just from our being in person together. And perhaps some of us began to feel like we had lost that magic feeling. Much like the people to whom Zechariah shared the Word of God, we too are a traumatized people who have suffered loss and disillusionment, who have found the road ahead to be much more indirect than we had hoped, to work harder than perhaps we had signed up for, and boy, oh boy, do we wish we could just go back to how things used to be. And that tension between going back and moving forward could tear us apart were it not for the word Zechariah brings us today. The people of God back then first began their efforts with rebuilding what had been laid low, but after some time, they laid a new cornerstone for a new temple, built upon the foundations of the past, but definitely not settling for them. Rather than going backward or starting completely over, they took the best and most solid things of what had previously undergirded their common life, reorganized them and reorganized themselves, and began to build on top of such a firm foundation by listening to the call of God upon their communal life and service, turning the sorrow of their past and present affliction and loss into their steadfast conviction for their present hope and future story as the people of God. Commentator Ben Allenberger writes, Zechariah's language about past and future is grounded in the concreteness of God's story with God's people. Zechariah redefines the community's present by proclaiming what God has done, is doing, and will do. He commends attention to God and to what God has promised. God's promises redefine what it is possible to imagine and believe. And what has God promised? The healing of the nations, the flourishing of the Garden of Eden, the, restora the restoration of peace among the peoples, a new creation, that is, all of creation renewed once again with life and love. How on earth could we possibly ever get there? Well, maybe a better question is how on earth did we ever depart from there in the first place? The recipe for God's kingdom come is simple enough, uh, as Allenberger writes. Practice authentic justice. Exhibit mutuality and compassion. Do not defraud the socially vulnerable. Do not plot each other's harm. Why the ancestors living in prosperity would reject such minimal and even obvious conditions of a community's well-being was as incredible in Zechariah's days as it remains in ours. But nonetheless, here we are at the precipice of the future undergoing the birth pangs of new creation and the church itself being made new and fit for a new age. And while we've been at work at this for some time already, we, like God's people of old, have found it, hard, have found it to be harder than we had ever imagined, requiring more of us than we had expected, or perhaps we were ready to give, or perhaps we were ready to let go and just as susceptible to spiraling downward into division and mistrust and diffusion of purpose as they were back then. But God still needed a faithful people to rebuild Jerusalem from the ruins, and God still needs a faithful church today to help rebuild a broken and fractured society from self-ruination. 
I know it's hard work, my children, God says, but let your hands be strong for the doing of such work, and do not be afraid. And indeed, Union Avenue, our hands are strong. Our homecoming today reminds us of the foundation upon which we build. Radical welcome and hospitality for the stranger. Fierce solidarity with the oppressed and vulnerable. Steadfast affirmation of the unique image of God within each of us and its beautiful expression. A commitment to praise God with our bodies and minds through the arts and education and explore the divine among us. An attitude of gratitude and posture of grace and forgiveness toward one another. Encouraging the best in one another. Investing in ourselves with hope and instilling seeds of transformation to become ever more loving, ever more generous, ever more courageous, ever more the disciples of Jesus Christ we are called to be. Our homecoming today reminds us of this foundation we share and invites us to lay a spiritual cornerstone marking the renewal of our efforts to rebuild despite the many challenges and mistakes. And Lord knows I've made a few. And to rebuild with love and grace and the determination to find new possibilities emerging from the rubble. The hard work of our hands transforming all that has become broken into fertile soil for new life to sprout up and spring forth from the ground of God's being and blossom as a rose to bring beauty into our lives and to herald the very life of the world to come. And with God's grace leading us in purpose and action, we will lack no provision to secure God's dreams for us. No challenge will be too great to meet, no hurdle too high to jump, no path too long to traverse, no problem too complex to solve, no division too deep to bridge. For we have in our hearts the love of Christ that not even death can defeat. And this house stands united in that love. Our God blesses the thirsty land by sending streams of water. And our God blesses this house by giving us the Holy Spirit, our comforter and advocate and empowerer supreme. And so may the people today hear the word of God that came to Zechariah, filling us with hope, healing us with love, and helping us transform our homecoming into home building for the future of our ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. I know it's hard work, my children, God says, but let your hands be strong for the doing of such work and do not be afraid. Let us rise up in love, O church, for surely the world needs it right now. And if we but trust in God to guide us, we will find the courage and the strength to do what others say cannot be done. And the people of God said, Amen.
friends some thoughts about being church together during these difficult times and about being thankful the church is not a place it's a people the church is not only a steeple above the tree line streets and cars rather it is a people proclaiming to the world that we are here for the work of healing and of justice. The church is not walls built stone upon stone, held together by mortar, but rather person, linked with person, linked with person, all ages and genders and abilities, a community built on the foundation of reason, faith, and love. The church is not just a set of doors open on Sunday morning but the commitment day after day and generation after generation of our hearts cracking open the doors of welcome to the possibility of new experience and radical welcome. The church is not simply a building, a steeple, a pew. The church is the gathering together of all people and experiences and fear and love and hope in our resilient hearts gathering however you can to say to the world, welcome, we see you, for the church is us, each and every one of us, together, a beacon of hope for the life of the world to come. Hello Church, thank you for joining in spirit here at Christ's Table. If you have communion elements, make sure they are ready at this time. At the beginning of the pandemic, we adopted a new puppy. When we brought Miss Phoebe Rose home, she was just seven weeks old and was a little ball of white fluff that could fit in my hands. Now fast forward about six and a half months, this great Pyrenees puppy is about 65 pounds and has gotten so big, so fast, and is still growing and changing. It reminds me a little bit about our Christian lives, how our faith and beliefs continually grow and change. Sometimes these changes occur very quickly, and sometimes they are slow and deliberate. It doesn't matter how quickly these, these changes happen, but what does matter is that we do not become stagnant in our faith. We need to continually be open to those messages that God sends us and continually grow in our Christian lives. And so now let us remember how when Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover and remember the promises of God, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Every time you eat of it, remember me. In like manner, after the supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the covenant renewed. My love poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of all sin Every time you drink of this, remember me. Remembering that Jesus is always with us, especially here, we now affirm that we are one through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, though we are many scattered throughout the earth. 
And so wherever you are, whatever elements you have gathered, rest your hands lightly upon these elements as a sacrament, or simply rest your hearts in the presence of our gracious host, as we ask God's blessing upon them. Holy God, you take the common and make them holy. As we eat and drink of these common things that you have made holy this day, take us and make us holy too. In Christ's name, amen. And now as we prepare to eat and drink and celebrate God's kingdom come, please pray with me the Lord's Prayer using whatever words are familiar to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us break bread together. The bread of life broken for you. And the cup of love poured out for you. As we close our feast of thanksgiving together, would you pray with me one more time? Holy God, thank you for this feast. We know that you love us. Help us be good and love other, uh, love other people too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for sharing together here at Christ's table. Dear friends in Christ, Go forth from our time together in worship to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.